Uh, Peter, what is your name and your four favorite numbers? <laughs> what? What the fuck? <laughs> You're supposed to say Peter, one, two, three, four. Oh, wow. I can't believe you didn't pick up on that. <laughs> you can't believe I didn't pick up on that thing you've <laughs> never said to me before. <laughs> I thought there was enough context clues. <laughs> I started thinking, like, I wonder what Peter's favorite numbers are. <laughs> wow, like, this is a really fun question. <laughs> well, congratulations, Sean. You gave us a cold open. Peter, okay. one, two, three, four. <laughs> Welcome to I'd Buy That for a Dollar, a podcast about inexpensive, common, and underappreciated records that are waiting to be rediscovered. I'm your host, Sean Hartman, duly appointed federal podcaster from the great state of Wyoming. You're not in Wyoming. You can't prove that. You know, Sean, I know that you have been really riding hard for this whole, all of, all of my intros are real. I think you've crossed the line on this one. <laughs> Not true. I've moved on from my capitalist pursuits, and I've just become a world traveler out there to help the people live with the common man. It's just the Wyoming part that I don't believe. You're, you're a ride or die for Philly. Well, that's my home, but, you know, I'm from Wyoming. What? Okay. All right. I believe you. I am glad for your belief, fellow podcast host, Peter. Hello, listeners. This is co-host Jeremy. I am excited to record today's podcast with my fellow co-hosts. I have oh. prepared by wearing my black and white Nike Decades. I have five dollars and three quarters in my pocket and am ready to talk about the cult Heaven's Gate Oh no, it appears I am mistaken. We are talking about the 1980 film Heaven's Gate. <laughs> I think Jeremy might have outsourced this one to AI. I don't know if he's actually here. Well, I, I, I did say in our last episode, the Saturday Night Fever soundtrack episode, that Jeremy is really pushing hard for AI and really embracing it. And uh, here's proof of it. It's funny because I actually uh, just wanted to do a rant about AI because I was listening to another podcast today and they were all amped up on Google's new thing that's going to like, like the host put in his credit card bill and then it created a podcast about his credit card bill. And it got me thinking about how this is going to parallel kind of the very thing our show is about, you know, talking about tangible, real records uh, in the face of, you know, endless music selection online. That's coming to podcasts. There's going to be endless podcasts, but we're going to be here being real humans doing a real podcast. Except for you when we try and talk about the soundtrack to a three and a half hour, very boring movie. Then you're going <laughs> to hand that one off to AI real quick. <laughs> no, I'm I'm going to admit my very human limits in not being able to watch a three and a half hour movie. <laughs> what is your limit? What's the longest movie you've sat through? Uh, huh. I really don't know the answer to that question. Hmm. All right, well, you, you think it over over the course of this episode, see if you have a, a good answer for us. Probably like Lord of the Rings. So what are we talking about today, well, guys? Well, I, hold on. I haven't even introduced myself yet. Oh, my God. <laughs> it's so off the rails already. <laughs> <laughs> I am co-host Peter Cook, and I'm the author of the new book, Rolling Under Review, 
films that subtly celebrate roller skating culture from Heaven's Gate to Boogie Nights. Hmm. And are there uh, maybe some subtle nods to a certain Bob Dylan? I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, oh, okay. (laughs) Moving on then. (laughs) Yeah, what are we talking about today? We are talking about David Mansfield's debut score to the classic 1980 film Heaven's Gate. The score was released on Liberty Records. Movie came out on United Artists. Yeah, there's a lot to get into, but before we do that, let's just listen to the first song, shall we? Yes. I'm game. Yes, let's do that. All right. We are going to go with Heaven's Gate Waltz. This is side A, track three. authentic barn burner from yesteryear sean (laughs) why yes it was indeed if i had been the one to come in i would have said that's a really modern sounding score (laughs) (laughs) yeah it's a it's an interesting score you know it differs from what one might think of as a score being much more you know big string section kind of like closer to classical music than anything else. And that was certainly the more common film score at the time. What what was the time? Well, 1980. Yeah. <laughs> I did say that once before, I believe, but yeah, this doesn't sound like a 1980 film score. <laughs> no, decidedly not. Maybe 1880. <laughs> that's, that's about when the picture is taking place. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, we'll we'll get into uh, a little bit more of the what's going on with the film in a bit here. But yeah, it is a period piece set in, I believe, 1892, around the events of the Johnson County War. So the, the soundtrack, the score, kind of the intention here is to create something that mixes like early Americana, but has a strong Eastern European influence to the sound. Um because there's a, there's a lot of immigrants in the film. The, the general conflict presented is between Eastern European immigrant populations in Wyoming and wealthy cattle barons who want to clear them out so they can have more cow pasture. Yeah, clear them out by any means necessary. Yes, um, also known as mass murder. Yeah, heavy film. It is an incredibly heavy film and there is 
there's so much about it. There's a whole history, even outside of just what's in the film. Um, so before we dive into all of that, I'm curious, what do you guys know about Heaven's Gate, the movie, not the cult? Yeah, not Hale Bop. I didn't know much about it until you started talking about it a whole lot recently, Sean. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you have been all about Heaven's Gate the last month or two. And once you decided that you were going to feature the soundtrack for that film as your soundtrack selection for our opening here of season six, I decided it was time that I dove into the three and a half hour (laughs) adventure that is Heaven's Gate. And I watched it and I really liked it. I did it all in one night. It was an undertaking Mm-hmm. How'd you feel when the credits started rolling? <laughs> <laughs> Can you sum that up real quick? I felt accomplished. <laughs> yeah, well, there's there's that at least. <laughs> Maybe a little bit queasy too. Yeah, worn out, queasy, but accomplished. And just lots to think about. Yeah, yeah, it was a lot to process. It actually might have served better to divide it up into two sittings. I was really into the first half, and I, I think by the second half I was I was getting a bit worn down already. Yeah, I would honestly say for people who do want to attempt this movie, it might work best in two nights. However, the second half of the movie is decidedly more depressing and violent, so I don't know if you want to just save that for one sitting. But yeah, there's there's a lot to focus on. There's a lot to take in, and uh, there's a huge range of opinions on the quality of this film and all of its elements. So like before I started obsessing over this movie recently, how aware of its reputation were you? I didn't really know much about it. I feel like maybe once I've read more about it, I feel like I've heard people make passing references to it from Mm -hmm. time to time. But I, I also think that I grew up in a era where heaven's gate meant the cult, not so much the film. Yeah. Now, what year was the Heaven's Gate cult? I'm one of probably the only people who know much more about the movie than the cult, so... It was around 1997. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, So yeah, Jeremy, what was your history with this? And I believe you attempted to watch the movie, so I'm very curious how (laughs) how many of those 219 minutes you were able to get through. Well, I had not heard of this film either until you started talking about it. Also, immediately think of the cult when I hear Heaven's Gate. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, I better watch this movie since we're going to be talking about the soundtrack. And I go and I put it on and I see it's three and a half hours long and was like, oh, my Lord. Now, true or false, you would have had time to watch this if you had not gone to see Legacy New Metal Act Corn the night before. (laughs) Busted. Hey, they ripped. I'm sure they did. Gojira ripped, too. Yeah. The Olympic metal band. Yeah. Yeah, but... I mean, the length is one thing, but also, like, I start the movie, and it starts with, like, a 15-minute speech to, I think it's, like, college graduates? Like, they're Harvard. Harvard. Okay. Yeah, I believe the class of 1870. Correct. Yeah, and it's like they're laughing at different things they say, and I can't even like make sense of what they're saying. It almost like <laughs> sounds like a foreign language. Yeah, this was you finally experiencing what it's like to be Peter going online and seeing memes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this that was it's 1870 youth meme culture that you experienced. Yeah, it's like I know what all of these words individually mean, but put them together and I'm just so lost. <laughs> Yeah, and that carried on for 15 minutes, and I was Mm -hmm. like, wow, I'm already over this movie, and I barely started. (laughs) And yeah, from there, it was, I don't know, it got kind of more interesting, but it was so slow, and I was tired from being up late after watching Corn. also. (laughs) (laughs) How long was the Corn concert? Why are we we going to burn me at the stake here? <laughs> Just curious. How long was the bagpipe solo? 
bagpipe solo was under a minute. Okay. A tight bagpipe solo. Yeah. Korn's whole set was under two hours, which any normal movie should be. <laughs> Normally, I would agree with you. This is no normal movie. <laughs> yeah. This is an exceptional, extraordinary movie. Fair. How far did you make it, Jeremy, into the film? Uh, you have a... I made it what's, about... What's the last thing you remember? I made it about 45 minutes in, I want to say. It was... Chris Christofferson, and he's like playing pool. That was the last thing I remember seeing. Okay. Yeah. I, mm-hmm. I know what's like long looks at each other and like, <laughs> I don't yeah, know. I, Everything just was very slow. And it, it was shot well, what I managed to watch. But yeah, it was, it was a pace I was not ready to handle. <laughs> it's a uh, internet brain. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, would you be surprised to learn that many people don't really make it much farther than that into the movie? <laughs> the opening scenes at Harvard, especially the extended dance sequences that follow the speech is often <laughs> yeah. where people are just like, you know what? This is the first like half an hour plus. I don't think this is for me. I'm, I'm out. The, the dance scenes, that's when I was all in. Uh, th- they were just so beautifully shot and choreographed. Yeah. My, the first time I watched it going through that intro, I was like considering turning it off. I was like, the visuals are great. And I I love this dancing and stuff, but I think I hate every character in this movie already. (laughs) And then the farther (laughs) I get into it, I was like, I think I was supposed to hate those characters and maybe this is a masterpiece. And then three and a half hours in, you know, got done. I was like, that is one of the greatest movies ever made. Wow. And I'll just say, there's not a lot of people who share that opinion. In fact, before the Heaven's Gate cult, this was kind of shorthand for the worst movie ever made. It was like generally the reputation that this film had. And a lot of people would share that opinion and like pass that reputation on without having actually seen it. Like the the concept and the negative reputation was larger than the actual impact of its content in a way. However, there was also, there's also plenty of people that say it's boring. It's not very good. It may look pretty, but it's, it's too long. The acting is terrible. The score is intrusive, et cetera, et cetera. There's, there were a lot of complaints. Yeah. And I think it's probably an important distinction that it's reputation as one of the worst films ever made is largely to the bloat that the perceived bloat of the film being such a big studio production that went over budget and over time, like, and obviously people might, you know, you put it up against some like B movie, it, it would probably succeed against that. But as far as like what's supposed to be this, what, what was marketed or, or conceived as being this big epic modern Western film uh many people felt it failed in that regard yeah at the time of release it was one of the most expensive if not the most expensive film he he spent 44 million dollars making it which was like quadruple the budget and then i think it made three million at the box office so it was a huge flop people blamed the film for not only United Artists going bankrupt and having to sell to another label the following year, but they also blamed it for completely changing the way how that Hollywood worked in the eighties, which both of those statements are incredibly unfair for one, but uh, you know, this movie coming out in 1980, people blamed it for the death of the, the auteur director. It seemed to be the end of the time when Hollywood would give large or unlimited budgets and complete creative control to these directors, these visionary directors. Yeah. After this, it was like, we've got to tighten the strings. We have to exercise more control. We are not allowing people to do whatever they want anymore. But you know, when you look at the larger film history context of this, like things were already shifting. We were moving from, these kind of movies into blockbusters already with star Wars and Indiana Jones and everything like that. And not to mention pop culture just shifted drastically from the seventies to the eighties in general. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
viewing it, I really felt like, not that I'm a, an expert or even really a big fan of the Western genre. I don't know that much about it, but I really felt like it was in many ways the the last of a certain kind of Western before moving into the 1980s. Yeah. I mean, part of the idea was that he was reviving an old Hollywood concept that wasn't in, that wasn't very popular anymore and kind of doing what is often called sort of a revisionist Western. Um, whereas less about romanticizing it and having these, you know, like purely good heroes and purely evil villains and things like that. And more having a morally complex characters and a realistic and depressing story <laughs> and just like showing, uh, how badly immigrants were treated in the westward expansion of America and how, uh, generally the rich people and the government were behind some very evil things that took place. And I don't think a lot of people were ready for that kind of a <laughs> concept in 1980. No, you know what recent film I feel that this is kind of the predecessor to, can you guess? Megalopolis. <laughs> Martin Scorsese's, Killers of the Flower Moon. Mm, I have not seen that one yet, but it's it's about the same running time. Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, then I'd love it. Sign me up and watch it as soon as we get done here. Yeah, it is. It is your kind of picture, Sean. All right. Well, I got to do it. Slow and boring and beautiful. No, it's not boring, but <laughs> yeah. I, I thought you were going to say The Revenant. Well. Yeah, I could see that too. That's, uh, I wouldn't, I don't know if I would so much call that recent, but it, yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> More modern, at least. Both starring Leonardo DiCaprio, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I first heard about this movie way back in 2010, even though the first time I saw it was less than a year ago. I learned about it from watching an excellent documentary called Z Channel, A Magnificent Obsession. Are either of you guys familiar with that doc by chance? No. I'm pretty positive I did watch that many years ago. Okay. Cool. Uh, well, real quick, the documentary is about one of the early paid cable film channels and its eccentric programming director, Jerry Harvey. Yeah. And Jerry was one of the only initial champions of Heaven's Gate. And uh, Z Channel actually began playing the uncut 219 minute version of it in 1982, just two years after its initial release and them playing this unedited version. They advertise it as the director's cut and like the version that Michael Cimino, the director wanted you to see and them pushing it the, this way actually kind of popularized the concept of a director's cut, which is a more, much more common thing that people want to see nowadays. Yeah. It's worth mentioning that, the film, I think that it opened briefly with the three and a half hour cut, and then they pulled it from theaters and re-edited it down to two and a half hours. Is that correct, Sean? And then re-released it. Yeah, it was released for one week. Um, part of the idea was they just like needed to get it out so that it would be eligible for award season. And then they pulled it and tried to cut it down to make it more appealing to people and, yeah, Michael Cimino had all kinds of complaints about being too rushed in the editing process. And then the edited down version was critically panned. So that is part of the reason why the actual film had a bad reputation at that point. Um, the version that people defend is definitely the extended director's cut, not the edited version. And you were telling me there's a cut down to one and a half hour version. <laughs> yeah. At some point, Within the last few years, the last, I don't know, five or 10 years or something, the director, Steven Soderbergh, decided to take this and edit it down to a normal film length, trying to like fix what he perceived as like a generally a mess of a film. And he made a one and a half hour cut called The Butcher Cut that you can find the link to download. I have not watched it <laughs> because I personally think that the three and a half hour cut is a masterpiece and why fuck with it? Yeah, I like Steven Soderbergh, but that's an odd move. On yeah, his part. yeah, <laughs> for sure. He's, he's full of odd moves, though. Yeah, and I can't imagine how you cut a movie in less than half and still keep its like core plot and message yeah yeah 
definitely. We've already talked about this a lot, and we do have to actually talk about the soundtrack and hear some more music, but I'm going to try and just summarize in like one or two minutes, like an elevator pitch of what I think is so good about this movie. Everyone generally agrees that visually it is stunning. It has just these incredible landscape shots in Wyoming, all of these like mountain backgrounds and just absolute gorgeous, perfectly framed scenes. He put tons of work into every detail. It's one of those movies where just like every little bit of it was obsessed over. The set design is incredible. Everything was built for the movie. The period clothing is awesome. And in general, I found this to be one of the most immersive period piece films that I've ever seen, which is not a genre that I like typically seek out too much. I just, I just felt like you got lost in it so easily. And on top of that, I thought the acting was amazing. Chris Christopherson's one of my favorites. I think this is a incredible role for him and everyone involved. R.I.P. Yeah, R.I.P. We're going to have to like get to our full <laughs> Chris Christopherson send-off at some point in the episode. But I think this is like kind of the high point of his acting career. That's saying something, because that wasn't just a, a side gig for him. <laughs> yeah, and this movie kind of killed his acting career. This was the last time that he was really a leading man in Hollywood. He kind of went back to the music business as a focus after all of the negative press from this and pretty much just worked as a character actor from this point on. It's, it's an all-star cast, and many of them toward the beginning of their career, Christopher Walken, Jeff Bridges... Isabel Huppert, John Hurt, who apparently was on break, or, or he shot the Elephant Man on break from Heaven's Gate, <laughs> correct? Yeah. One of the, the many reasons why this film was so expensive was because Michael Cimino demanded that every actor and everyone involved in the movie stayed on set for the entire shooting process, which went way too long. So, like, you, people who were in this movie for seconds we're being paid to be on set for like a year. <laughs> wow. Um, so there's, you know, some people love that experience, the camaraderie, having this like 1200 <laughs> person town sprung up and everyone just like hanging out in period clothing all the time. And some people got very upset and left. Yeah, I can imagine that that could be a, a highly divisive atmosphere. <laughs> right. <laughs> Well, another great component of the film was the score. <laughs> the score. And like I said, the the immersiveness of this movie, I think the score has a lot to do with that. I think it's a fascinating score. Um, the It really works well with the themes of the movie. At times, it like plays with the mood that's happening, and at times, it contrasts it in interesting ways and really just makes you feel like you're existing in the late 1800s and seeing how people really lived. Yeah, it's it's evocative. Mhm. Mm Let's go ahead and hear some more of it now, why don't we? Let's. I'm going to flip this record over and listen to Sweet Breeze, side B, track 1. <laughs> Thank you. 
that is definitely a standout piece from the film for me. I really like the space that it is initially given. It has a lot of room to breathe. It actually reminds me a little bit of, of some of the, like, I don't know a better way to say it than the, the gut guitar stuff that Neil Young did when he composed the music for Jim Jarmusch's 1995 Western Dead Man. Uh, but of course, this also has a little bit of that, that, that Eastern European flavor and even a little bit spaghetti Western kind of sound to it. Yeah. Actually, at one point, Ennio Morricone was considered for the score of yeah, this yeah. film. Yeah, the, the definitive composer of that ilk. Yeah, yeah. I thought the soundtrack really does reflect how the movie feels, as you kind of alluded to earlier, that there's often these extremely long intros and then the band will kick in like more than halfway into the song. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it, it just doesn't feel rushed or anything, which is kind of the same way the movie feels like. So it makes sense. One thing David Mansfield said about his technique in recording this, which by the way, he is performing every instrument on this score. It is a one man score. Oh, wow. All of the acoustic instruments, he purposely played as quietly as he could and very close mic because he wanted it to sound like a loud whisper as mm. opposed to a score that was beating you over the head. Yeah, it, it they do feel very close mic to the instruments. Uh, it's It was actually a great, I watched at least part of it on headphones and it was a great film to watch <laughs> wearing headphones. Yeah, one of the contrasts in the film is portraying some very intimate and personal experiences with these like massive backdrops. You'll be seeing just like, you know, a few poor people struggling in the middle of like a gorgeous epic mountain range <laughs> with these like beautiful vistas in every direction. And uh, I thought the the soundtrack just kind of like just fit that vibe perfectly. It's not like an easy thing to represent, but David Mansfield did a great job with this one. Yeah, agreed. The amount of attention that you could tell went into each shot is only matched by the, I feel like the attention to detail of the soundtrack. Everything feels very considered and deliberate. Yeah. yeah. All feels organic at the same time. And the impression I get of the production of this movie was that it was not just a obsessive passion project for the director, but generally everyone involved with this movie was pretty convinced that they were working on an absolute masterpiece. Um, some people had said like, we thought we were creating like the next gone with the wind and everyone was just putting so much work into it and often working on it in a very like personal manner that like this film felt important and close to home for a lot of the folks involved, David Mansfield, including because uh, David not only did the score, but he actually has a pretty significant role in the film itself. As far as acting, one of my favorite scenes in the movie and kind of what I think of as like the centerpiece of the movie is this another extended dance sequence, <laughs> but this mm -hmm. time in the small town with immigrant communities in their community rolling rink, which has been named heaven's gate. The scene opens with David Mansfield doing an extended violin solo while roller skating. Yeah. Yeah, that is a very visually striking scene and of course sonically as well. I you know, just like I can't claim to be an expert on westerns, I also can't claim to be an expert on film cameras and equipment, but I, I had to wonder while watching that scene, this is 1980, if that was an early use of the steady cam to achieve that, that mm. all that movement fall, tracking him around. Yeah. I have not hit the point of like obsessive knowledge on this to be able to answer that question yet, but uh, <laughs> you will. <laughs> yeah. I know that the, the cinematographer was a, a legendary figure with a massive credit of important films that he's worked on and is very respected, but yeah, there's a lot going on. As far as David Mansfield's uh, violin roller skating solo, the film version that you see is a live performance. It's not him 
like skating around mimicking to an overdub, he really learned how to do that. In fact, the whole cast was given roller skating lessons so that they could all roller skate as if this was like the natural thing that they all did all the time. And a setback filming by three months. <laughs> Famously, by day five of shooting Heaven's Gate, they were four days behind schedule. <laughs> that in that scene, which it, I think many would feel is a, a centerpiece of the film, was not even included in the the two and a half hour cut, to my understanding. Yeah, just I can't even imagine that. But yeah, <laughs> let's get into a bio for David Mansfield. Although real quick, first I want to read the list of the instruments that he is playing on this soundtrack. You are hearing him play violin, viola, mando cello, mandolin, cello, classical guitar, acoustic guitar, percussion, and bass. Wow. Nice. Now let's learn about where this guy comes from, who he is. How did he get hired to do this film score with no real previous film score experience? I'm guessing he was a, a quacky duck prior to this. Hmm. <laughs> There's only one way this could work. <laughs> David Mansfield was born September 13th, 1956 in New Jersey. His parents were both classical musicians. And in fact, his father was first violinist in the New York Philharmonic. David was trained in violin from an early age and also quickly picked up guitar and pedal steel. How early? His, <laughs> I did not see a report of exactly how early, so I can't. I cannot offer that for your consideration, <laughs> unfortunately. Right. Jeremy will completely uh, be skeptical about his credibility as a musician if it was claimed to be too early, even though he's hearing <laughs> the results of it. <laughs> David's first band was called Quacky Duck and His Barnyard Friends. <laughs> that sounds like something from garfield and friends or something like that yeah when, when i say someone's first band was named that i feel like most people would think like oh he did that in like junior high like that's cute but uh in fact this was a country rock group that was signed to warner brothers and released an album in 1974 i mean we have to remember that graham parsons and chris hillman had the flying burrito brothers <laughs> That's true. So yeah, country rock groups with goofy names was kind of par for the course at this point. Exactly. Uh, part of the reason that group got signed was because it featured two sons of legendary crooner, Tony Bennett. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's, that's, you've gone as far as I went in the David Mansfield bio. <laughs> <laughs> I knew quacky duck would be full of Nepo babies. Yeah. <laughs> So he's, uh, he's about 18 when he's got his first major label contract and in, in a famous band with some notable Nepo babies. Shortly after the album's release, David meets a little guy named Bob Dylan. Uh, Bob is impressed with this teenager's abilities and asked him to join his Rolling Thunder review in 1975. And David continues recording and touring with Bob Dylan through 1978. Those are some good years with a good crew. Yeah. Uh, and many people consider David Mansfield to be among the like most notable and gifted of Dylan's prominent sidemen. Along with Bromberg. Yes. <laughs> During this time, David started a new group called the Alpha Band featuring two other Rolling Thunder Review members, Stephen Souls and T-Bone Burnett. <laughs> you know, I did see that part in my, what I considered an intro of having something to do with the beta band, but did not, <laughs> did not go that route. It, something could have happened. We'll see. You know, we could cover an alpha band record on the show. Those things are still available and they're They're pretty good. Interesting little albums. Uh, they released three of them on Arista Records before breaking up in about 1978. Right before this picture went into production. Yeah, it's all leading up to it. At this point, David is a renowned session musician. Not only is he working with Dylan and has his own deal in his own group, he's also featured on albums with Joan Baez, Eric Anderson, Jim Croce, 
And he's on a live album with Maria Muldaur and the Chambers Brothers, no less. Yeah. He keeps good company. Yeah. An impressive resume for being like 19, 20. 20, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he looked very young in the film. Yeah, I, I believe he's 22, 21 on the film. So production on Heaven's Gate begins in early 1979. Initially, David Mansfield was not the one who had been hired to do the score. That was, in fact, a guy you may have heard of, John Williams. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, like Star Wars, Jaws, etc. Yeah. So John was uh, on set with the crew and seeing how quickly things were getting delayed and knowing the rule if he was supposed to be there for the whole thing, he, uh, he jumped ship because he was like, guys, I've, uh, you know, I'm having a good time, but I got to go work on the empire strikes back and Indiana Jones <laughs> and Superman. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> From what I understand, they tried to get Ennio Morricone to replace him. That didn't work. So they turned to young David Mansfield and I think, you know, knowing that with the way this movie was being made, they probably weren't going to be able to convince a name film score guy to work on this. It makes sense that they turned to kind of an unknown, someone who could be excited about it because he'd never worked on a film before. And someone who would be like, yeah, like just uh, my bands broke up and everything and got nothing going on. I'll just move to Wyoming for a year. Why not? Let's do this. Yeah. Well, yeah, I would say most other major composers that would be at the the level to score something like this would be way too busy doing just like would happen with John Williams. They they're doing probably several films a year. Yeah. It's a big ask. Another reason that David was excited to work on this, his parents were both of Eastern European descent and in the casting process for this film, it was, you know, can you act and can you do this and everything? But also there was priority for people who looked Eastern European or had a background and especially people who could, who were bilingual in any Eastern European language. And also it was a big plus if you already knew how to roller skate and David kind of checked a lot of those boxes. He had some roller skating experience. He was an incredible musician and the whole telling the story of European immigrants felt very personal and something that he felt like this, this unique combination of European and American music was something that was in his DNA and something that he could really represent. Yeah. I, I think there is a fair amount of non English spoken in the film that is not subtitled of various immigrants. Correct. And one quick bit of kind of funny trivia. This is the first film that Willem Dafoe was in. However, he's uncredited and can only be seen as a background extra in one scene. Yeah. He was supposed to have a much larger role in this and he got the role by lying about being able to speak Dutch. <laughs> he had memorized an audition in Dutch by just learning it phonetically and did it so convincing that they hired him. And then at some point, Michael Cimino asked him to improvise more Dutch dialogue. And Willem was like, I don't actually speak the language. And he was then kind of demoted to a background actor. And one day while they were delaying the actors for like eight hours to get the lighting right, Willem accidentally laughed a little too loud at one of the other extras jokes and was promptly fired for interrupting the flow of the set. And never worked again. Never again. <laughs> what could have been? <laughs> there were several names that I, you know, just in looking at the cast that I was expecting to see and then didn't remember <laughs> noticing. And that was one of them. Mm -hmm. uh, Mickey Rourke was another. He is in there. I just did not recognize him <laughs> when he was <laughs> in the film until afterwards when I was looking at things. Uh, I think there were a few others where that was the case, too. It was there's so many faces that you're seeing and some of them. I mean, Jeff Bridges to me was almost kind of, I'm not used to seeing him that young. <laughs> you, you may have noticed that the character Jeff Bridges was playing also had the last name Bridges. And yes. that's because Jeff was portraying his ancestor. What? Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I did notice that, but I did not know that. Like I said, so many of the people involved in this had very personal stakes in this movie. This was a passion project for a lot of people. And I think it shows. 
Oh, I'm, I'm just going to have to lay back in the cut while my mind continues to be blown at that detail. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to keep blowing it. Here we go. So right after David's iconic roller skating violin solo, there's a live band performing at the dance. Uh, the band was playing live, again, not to a backing track or anything, and it features some notable musicians, including T-Bone Burnett, also Sean Hopper from Huey Lewis and the News, and Norton Buffalo from the Steve Miller Band. <laughs> the combination... We yeah. never knew we needed. <laughs> All pretending to be 1800s musicians. Truly wild. Truly wild. So like I said, Michael Cimino was largely blamed for this film's failure. The press was attacking this movie before it even came out. And when it was released, it was like everyone was primed to hate it, whether they actually hated it or not. What, was this his follow-up to The Deer Hunter? Yes. And that, yeah. had been, why, that had been very successful. Yeah, The Deer Hunter was a huge financial and critical success, which is why he got to make this epic and have a huge budget, because they're like, this guy can't fail. But when it came out, yeah, he was blamed for a lot of the failure of it, which was unfair. However, there was also a lot of negativity directed specifically towards Chris Christopherson and David Mansfield. David was actually nominated for both a Razzie and a Stinker Award for what many consider to be a bad and very intrusive score. Oh, wow. That I know, right? I mean, I can understand to an extent that this... I understand that people just basically received this film or, or judged this film, uh, probably some without even seeing it, just by its reputation that it gained in the process of making it. it like, it, it kind of on arrival was was hated. But to actually go and start picking apart things that are bad about it, you you would think you'd, how could you not notice? Actually, it's brilliant. <laughs> like if you actually start yeah. to look at the details of it. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, it just blows my mind that people were attacking Christopherson's acting ability for this movie. Yeah. No, I don't get that either that they wouldn't, I mean, it's a brilliant performance. I can't think of a, a weak performance that I saw in it everyone's bringing something unique to the table absolutely and i saw an interview with christopherson where he was saying that he took this role because he felt like it was just him he was like that's just me i'm playing myself because yeah i mean it's a it's an interesting role it's a definitely kind of a hero but he's still very flawed and I mean, a bit of an anti-hero bit of an anti-hero for sure which i think also just speaks to Christopherson's greatness and interesting character was that he was willing to like identify with both the things he liked about himself and the things he was critical about with yeah. his character. <laughs> but, you know, during the fallout of this and the negative reputation that was attached for years, Christopherson always maintained that he was very proud of this film and would remain proud of it for the rest of his life. Uh, that, that speaks to his character because some people would probably just roll along with it. Oh yeah, that was, that was bad. Ha ha ha. Yeah. Uh, Christopherson was always one to hold true to what he believed in. Yeah. I'm so, it's, it's truly sad that he, that we're recording this the, the day after learning of his death. So it's, it's heavy. I've seen a lot of people, uh, you know, talk about, you know, how much various things he did meant to them. <laughs> yeah. There's, there's so much to, to appreciate about him from the casual fan to people that are more into his politics than his art and like you know, everything. I've seen all the tributes. It's like, you know, my favorite guy from blade to like, this is the guy, this was like the only guy who was there for Sinead O'Connor when she was being attacked, you know, mm -hmm. or like being like one of the rare people in Hollywood who would like stand up for Palestinian rights and just like again and again on the right side of history, even though it would negatively affect his career and finances often. Yeah. A, a real Renaissance man. Yeah. And maybe the coolest guy who ever lived can we just say that? <laughs> yeah, why not? All right, let's 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 make that official. <laughs> and on that note, how about another song? All right, what you got? Next up, we are going to hear the big dance number, Mamo Two-Step. This is also the only song on the album that was not written by David Mansfield. This is a cover of a Doug Kershaw song. 
All right. We're looking at side B, track two. Some listeners may have noticed a similarity between that track and the first one we featured, Heaven's Gate Waltz. That's because Heaven's Gate Waltz was kind of uh, sort of an interpolation of it. It was slowed down and kind of reinvented as a slightly different style for the film. But I thought picking a kind of modern Doug Kershaw song to cover for this was an interesting choice because it just fits perfectly and having that that kind of Cajun flavor into it really just helps with this cultural boiling pot Americana fusion score that we got going on. It definitely fits the film. I did notice listening to the soundtrack, though, this song jumped out as like different than the rest. I think it is a little bit that kind of Cajun thing, and it's just more energetic and kind of up-tempo than... Pretty much every other song on the soundtrack. Yeah, and, and that's because during the scene where this song is playing, everyone is kind of going buck wild. This is like the big dance number. Jeff Bridges is like drunk as hell and falling down and like vomits out the side door. Oh, yeah. <laughs> People are going nuts. And that, that was one of the things I really appreciated about it. I was like, man, I feel like anytime I see a period piece and there's a band, it's like, Everyone's like, oh, the band is playing. Like, you, you don't get the feel like this is an exciting thing that people are, like, really letting loose on. And this was, like, the first time where I saw that. I was like, yeah, this is this is how people would actually interact with this music, it feels like. Yeah, that was something I appreciated about the film is the time that it would often take to just immerse you as the viewer into the setting that you were being placed in. Yeah. You want to feel what everyone's feeling in the movie. Well, I don't know if you always want to feel what they're feeling. <laughs> well, the, the goal was to make you feel it, whether you enjoyed it or not. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, the, this is, it's worth just saying, you know, the brilliant film, definitely, you know, worth watching, but uh, there's some very heavy content in it. Yeah. There is uh there's a lot of violence. There's uh, violence towards women. Be warned. It's <laughs> something you want to go into in the right frame of mind. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm just going to kind of wrap up David Mansfield's career real quick, and then we can do our recommended similar albums after that. Despite all the negative press and how it really affected specifically Christofferson and Chimino's careers after this, David 
seemed to be mostly unaffected. He went on to write scores for over 30 more films and television projects, including three more Michael Cimino films. He also did a collaboration with Van Dyke Parks on the show Broken Trail, and perhaps his most successful project was 2002's Divine Secrets of the Yaya Sisterhood. Oh, yeah. You know, that's one, I remember that being a, a popular title. I never saw it, yeah. or have, not, have yet to see it, I should say. It was a hit. David was also a founding member of Bruce Hornsby and the Range. Played on one or two tracks on the album, but quit the band before their first tour. He's featured on Dwight Yoakam's Guitars, Cadillacs, Etc., Etc. from 1986. And he's also played on multiple albums by Japanese New Age fusion jazz legend Osamu Kitajima, who I will likely be featuring on this podcast at some point. You specifically. <laughs> Unless one of you guys want to take it. I don't know, but I think that's more my wheelhouse. I would agree. Stealing it out from underneath you is kind of my wheelhouse, though. Ooh, okay, well, it's a race. See our incredible string band episode for <laughs> context. <laughs> well, do you guys want to know where to look if you enjoyed this and need some more similar soundtracks in your life? Yeah. Yeah, I'm throwing a barn party and i just need more tracks like this gotta burn that barn all right my first recommendation another 1980 film that surprisingly has a kind of similar score certainly not the exact same theme but it's close enough I'm talking about rye cooter and his score to the long riders 1980 hmm uh, you know I, I can't say i'm familiar with the film or the soundtrack I have not seen the film, but I listened to the soundtrack, and it is good. Ryan Cooter is a very talented guy who's done a lot of interesting projects. We should feature some of his stuff at some point. He was in Captain Beefheart's band when he was like 19. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Among many other important things. Uh, next up, one of the only Bob Dylan albums that you might be able to find for cheap was his oh. soundtrack, Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid from mm -hmm. 1973. Mm-hmm a good comparison yeah i feel like many record stores you go into and if you look in the bob dylan you know little section there that's like the one album they'll have there yeah you might see like empire burlesque yeah planet waves maybe if you're lucky planet waves right or uh street legal another record that david mansfield was on ah. i kind of like that one honestly yeah that's uh one of the better cheap dylan albums for sure uh, last recommendation, I will say that the actual result of this album is pretty different from the score, but I think contextually it's interesting, and that is Ennio Morricone's score to Days of Heaven from 1979, a weirdly similar film in some ways because they both used had extensive use of shooting during magic hour, which gives you this kind of interesting lighting that is hard to replicate. That's Terrence Malick's second film. Yes. So if you wondered what it would have sounded like if Ennio Morricone had actually been hired to do this film, it probably would have come out pretty similar to Days of Heaven from 1979. Very cool, Sean. And very cool soundtrack in general uh, and film. Thank you for taking me with you on this one. I'm sorry we couldn't bring Jeremy. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I'll try and break it into like a mini series and do it Th in like 45 minute chunks. That's mm -hmm. a good way. I mean, that's a good way to digest it, absorb it. I, I think is, yeah, 45 minutes or so like a modern show that's maybe four or five, six episodes long would be. Yeah, I support it. Um, in lieu of final thoughts, would you guys just like a couple random examples of why this movie was so expensive? Yeah, that sounds fun. Okay. One of the towns that was built, Michael Cimino decided that the buildings were too close together and demanded that they be torn down and both moved six feet back and then refused to allow just one of the side of buildings to be moved 12 feet instead. Yeah, that's, I did, I think I did see that detail somewhere in that yeah. really uh, it illustrated the obsessive attention to detail. Supposedly there were many like chests of drawers filled with 
period accurate clothing made for the film that were never taken out of the drawers or seen on camera. But but they were there. They were there and paid for. <laughs> um, Couldn't have empty drawers. The the huge epic battle scene at the end of the movie, he paid for an underground irrigation system for the whole field just to make sure that the grass was as green as possible so it could contrast all of the red blood and gore that he was about to throw all over it. <laughs> you know, wow. I, I, I'll just say I really loved John Hurt's monologue during that, that uh, in the midst of the kind of the, the final battles in the film yeah. that was a huge highlight of the latter half of the film for me. <laughs> yeah, man, I, I could just go on and on about all that stuff. Also uh, musician, Ronnie Hawkins was in the movie playing the, the general uh, uh, yeah. in the final battle. Another kind of loose Dylan connection there mm-hmm. since uh, the band that would go on to be Dylan's backing band started with Ronnie Hawkins, correct? Yes, exactly. They were the Hawks. Yeah. Last thing, at one point, United Artists realized that they were paying way more than anyone should for the uh, for renting the land that was being used. And they looked into who owned the land and why they were they charging so much. And it turned out the land was owned by Michael Cimino. <laughs> <laughs> the true motive comes out. Yes. Amazing. <laughs> wow. Well, this has been... A lot of fun and uh, very insightful. Thank you again, Sean, and thank you listeners for joining us here as we get really into season six here and start talking about soundtracks lesser known than Saturday Night Fever. <laughs> I don't, yeah. <laughs> I, I, this one especially, I, I don't know how much the score has really been appreciated, but you do see this one out there fairly commonly, Sean. It's inexpensive, but I don't see it very commonly. I don't think many copies ever really circulated. I had to actually order my copy online, if I'm being entirely honest here. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, it sounds like with the the kind of the lack of success of the the film, yeah, it probably wasn't something people were running out to buy up in mass quantities. No. But if you do find it, you'll, you'll probably not pay too much for it, which is... Good for the theme of the show. Yep. It's it's certainly a cheap record. At least it is right now. Once it gets the eye by that bump, everyone's going to go out there, watch Heaven's Gate, buy the soundtrack, obsess over it just like me. And don't look into who owns all the copies, because I might have bought them all already. <laughs> Ooh. I'm going to sell them <laughs> for so much. Oh, I can't fail. That's actually why you joined on this. That uh, you got this whole like little cottage industry going, <laughs> 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 buying up all the cheap records we're going to feature and then selling them, slinging them. We're on to you, Jeremy. You have revealed your true motive. I've learned it from the director of this movie. What can I say? <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, we should mention that if you do like what you've heard today and would. And, you know, if you've already caught up on all, I don't know, almost 250, almost 250 or so episodes of the podcast that we have available and want more, you can head over to patreon.com slash I'd buy that podcast where we have bonus episodes, mixes, a vinyl tier where we will send you records. Yeah. Help support us. Continue to do this. Yeah, or if you just want our podcast to keep existing so you don't have to listen to all the other podcasts that are playing like a thousand ads each these days. Yeah. Someone sounds bitter. (laughs) I love listening to podcasts, and I've noticed since, you know, a lot of the money from the corporate folks have been pulled out of the podcast world. They're responding by just running way more ads and it's driving me nuts. (laughs) Well, I'm sure you're the only one. So it's going to be funny in in several years down the road when we've actually added advertising to the podcast and the listeners get to this point in this episode and they've heard several (laughs) advertisements butt in throughout the episode. I hope Jeremy complaining about this is like interrupted by a Casper mattress ad in a few years. (laughs) (laughs) Won't happen. I won't let it happen. All right. We'll see. (laughs) 
<laughs> Sign up for our Patreon so that I never have to let it happen. Thank you. <laughs> there you go. That's your motivation. And I will say, if you do watch this movie because of this podcast, maybe uh, join our Facebook group and tell us what you thought. We'd yeah. love to hear other people's opinions on this controversial masterpiece. Yeah. Yeah, just go over to Facebook, search the groups for I'd buy that for a dollar and join the party. We we've had we have good participation over there nowadays. It's a good crew. Come on in. All right, well, we're going very long just like the film here, so <laughs> let's wrap <laughs> this up. Uh what Sean are we gonna go out on? We're going out on the final track on the album, The Long Road, Side B, Track Six. This was my favorite of your picks, but you didn't pick. There was like, I'd say almost a third of this album is just two guitars playing off each other. And I loved all those tracks most. And this one is pretty close to that. So this is my favorite of the ones you picked. Nice. Yeah, I don't think there's a bad song on this album at all. It was, once again, difficult to pick just four tracks, but I'm, I'm glad you vibed with this one. Well, very good. Beautiful. Let, let's listen to that. This has been I'd Buy That for a Dollar. I'm Peter Cook. I'm Jeremy Ruggles. And I'm Sean Hartman. <laughs> Thank you.